Okay, let me give you the, the gist of the whole message right now. Uh, th th this is basically what, what I want us to walk away with. All of our work in this life will contribute in some way to the blessedness of heaven. That means for the Christian, your work, your art, your dreams, your hopes, your studies, your struggles, your relationships, all of that will somehow be part of your heavenly reward. God calls us to work alongside him. And this is not easy work. There are no vacations. And we often don't understand our part in it. And we're incapable of doing it perfectly. But we trust that God will complete and fulfill us in the end. So that's the gist of what we're learning today. And um, this is what Jesus himself teaches. At 12 years old, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem without telling his parents. And when they find him again, we read that they were very worried and probably pretty frustrated too. And his answer to them is not the normal answer a 12-year-old would typically give his parents in that situation. He says, Shouldn't, you should know that I have to be in my father's house. Uh, and that's the part I'm going to focus on this morning. Um, but before I, I go further, there's two points I want to get out quick. Out of, the, out of the way quickly, not because they're of small importance, but because they provide the context for everything else. And that's simply that this incident with Jesus reveals his humanity and his divinity at the same time. Okay, this is the only, uh, the only story we have of Jesus in his childhood. Okay, and, and Luke's the only one who re records it. We know that Luke went around interviewing people to get... Uh, to get the story of his gospel. He talked to eyewitnesses, and it seems pretty obvious, pretty conclusive. He talked to Mary. And then we read at the, the end of this passage that Mary didn't understand really what was happening, but she knew something was important, and so she treasured it in her heart. And of course, we read that a few different times with Mary, and it's a good thing she did, because that's why she was able to tell this. When Luke came around knocking on her door, saying, hey, you know, I, I, God has put it on my heart to write this, an, another gospel account of Jesus' life. Do you have anything to tell me? And she thinks back and she brings out this story from his childhood. Uh, his human and divine nature are revealed. Um, the, his divine nature, pretty obviously, he's talking to his mother and who he culturally calls his father, everyone else called, you know, they're, they're, even the scripture here calls them both his parents, even though we know uh, his divine parentage. And yet he says, I'm in my father's house, the temple in Jerusalem, his father's house. For all we know, this could be the first time that he's been back to Jerusalem since he was an infant. It's possible. Nazareth is not close to Jerusalem. Um, so he's saying, I have, I already know at 12 years old, I have I know that I am the son of God the Father. I have a connection to the Father that no one else can have. I'm of the same essence as him. And yet, this also reveals his humanity. Jesus grew up in the same way, in the same order that the rest of us do. That means that as a baby and a toddler, he learned about the world with his five senses, by grabbing things, putting them in his mouth, making baby noises just the same way every other little child does. And when he became a young boy, he, his ability to think uh, increased. He was able to think symbolically. His language use improved, just like every other child in school goes through. And now in this story, he's 12 years old. Raise your hand if you're 12 years old, or within a year or two. Hey, we got one back there. And Jesus was 12 years old also. And he was not some alien 12-year-old who had no common experience with anything we go through. He was a real boy. Didn't mean for that to be a Pinocchio reference, but he, <laughs> he was a real boy. <laughs> um, without sin, but a real human boy. That means he had friends, and he had teachers, and he probably had kids in the neighborhood who didn't like him, and games that he would play with them. He would laugh and play, because that's how God made kids to be. And now 12, though, is a very important age. And if you are 12 years old or close to that age, and, and if you're older, maybe you remember what it was like. Um, there's this kind of sense of, I'm not quite the child I used to be. And 
some of us, if you're like me, when you started to at 12, 13, 14, middle school, you, there were aspects of that you didn't like. Like, wait a minute, I kind of like being a kid. I don't have responsibilities, but my ability to think and do things has grown, so I'm, I'm having more fun in the world, more fun with my friends, but I still don't have to, oh, but I know something's going to change in just a couple years. Well, it actually changed a bit quicker if you were in one of these older cultures. 12 or 13 was typically the age where a boy would transition into manhood, and he would be expected to start studying the law of Moses, the Torah, formally. He'd be expected to take on more responsibilities, to learn the trade of his father, and to basically not act like a child anymore. And this could be sort of a speculation, but this seems likely uh, why Mary and Joseph made this long journey from Nazareth all the way down to Jerusalem for this Passover. It's not very likely that they did this every year. That's a, it's a pretty big trip. No cars. Uh, they probably were not rich enough to ride on camels or donkeys, so they were probably walking the whole time. But this is, it seems likely that this was a final big trip to Jerusalem to bring Jesus to the temple as part of his preparation of, for entering manhood. He's going to begin his formal instruction. Now, Jesus is pretty clear from this incident. He'd already been learning about the Bible. He'd been reading it as much as he could, or he'd been listening to his parents read it, or to a, a rabbi in, in the synagogue. So it's not like you know they start from square one. But this is where his, the study of the Torah really becomes important for uh, a boy. And he, he, Jesus had to learn the Bible, the scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, just like any of us would, by reading it, by studying it, by praying over it, by trying to apply it to his life. And as he studied and prayed, the boy Jesus, he discovered that God had set aside a special work for him, teaching and ministry. See, he didn't just magically begin to know all of this but, uh, growing up. Sometimes, I think when I was a kid, I kind of assumed, well, Jesus, you know, he's God. So he just, even as a kid, he just kind of knew everything. But that's not the picture we get here. We show him, we see him studying, working at this. And understanding more clearly than anyone else was. And here he is, he's in the temple, and he's doing exactly what he knows he's supposed to do. He knows that, obviously, this is the word of God. I'm supposed to be studying it. I'm supposed to be learning from it. All the prophecies about the Messiah stand out to him clear as day because he doesn't have any sin or any corruption in his mind to keep him from understanding. And so he realizes this is what I'm supposed to do. My father in heaven has appointed uh, the stuff for me, and he's studying so that he can become closer to his father, so he can know his father's will. And he takes it for granted that Mary and Joseph will understand this. Don't you know uh, that I must be about my father's business? So a lot of modern translations will say, in my father's house, uh, but like we just heard, the older King James says, about my father's business. And as far as I can tell, they're both correct. Uh, when Luke was writing the gospel, he actually doesn't use a word for the, where, we, where we put house or business. He just says, uh, Jesus says, in my father's, and father's is a, the possessive form of the word. So it's like, in, in my father's things, about my father's business, in my father's house. Like Those are all kind of implied in the context. And it, it makes sense if you think about... Um, referring to someone's house as being more than just the building they live in, but as being their, their livelihood, their business, especially if it, you're living in a time when you worked out of your home a lot of the times. So to, if you say of a son that he's involved with his father's things or involved with his father's business, it's the, it, it means it all together. Yes, he's probably involved in the upkeep of the house, but he's involved in doing the things that his father wants to be done things that his father, that benefit his father, things that his father probably would be doing, the same kind of things that his father does. So 12-year-old Jesus, he knows his purpose in life is to do the work of God the Father. And he begins to do that work as soon as he can. Now, we know that we are all supposed to do the work of God. In fact, more than that, we're to imitate Christ. So if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, or you can just listen to me read it. 1 Peter 2, 21, 
For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. We must follow the example of Jesus. Now, Jesus is called to a ministry of teaching, of healing, and of ultimately of saving all of his chosen people through his death and resurrection. So what about us? If I ask you, are you doing God's work in your life right now? What would you say? Here's another question. Is God's work only preaching and evangelism and church stuff? Because sometimes I think we, we think of it that way, whether consciously or not. I've heard uh, people ask other Christians, hey, I need some advice. Should I quit my job and, and do something church or missions related? I don't really have the skills for those things, but I'm worried that I, I'm not really serving God if I'm just working a normal job. I think a lot of people have felt that way at some point. And if you've ever felt that there was some kind of great divide between holy work and, and regular work, um, and that one of them kind of gets you more points with God than another, well, this message is for you. Because the truth is, everything that we do in submission to Jesus is God's work. Turn to John chapter 6, if you can. John 6, uh, just verses 27 and 29 a crowd of people have gathered around Jesus. They've seen him do the miracle where he feeds the 5,000, and they want free food. It says that right in the text. They want free food. They're hoping he'll do another miracle. And Jesus seems to get kind of frustrated because he tells them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, well, what, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So that's, I think, a great divide between meaningful work and work that will, in the end, be meaningless. Meaningful work comes out of a true belief in Jesus, a true faith in him. If you really believe in Jesus, you'll love him and you'll follow him and you'll seek to become like him. In fact, in, in John, just a few chapters later, John chapter 14, Jesus continues to say, uh, this is John 14, verses 23 and 4. He says, look, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Notice how Jesus connects things in these verses. He says, to, to love Jesus is to obey Jesus. And as we love and obey Jesus, we will experience the love of the Father. And when we experience the love of the Father, that means both the Father and the Son will live with us. So just like 12-year-old Jesus goes about his Father's work in the temple out of love, the temple was called the house of his Father, uh, so also we do God's work in God's house. Only now God's house is not a building. It's us. It's the people of God. God lives within us. And we speak of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us a lot, but here it says that the Father and the Son do as well in some way. Wherever we go in the world, God is with us. And that means that God is with us no matter what work we are doing. Now, Maybe you're thinking, well, hold on. I mean, I, people are, do all kinds of work that are sinful. So surely we can't say that a Christian can engage in those kinds of things and still be doing God's work. Well, yeah, obviously uh, we can't say that. Because you can get jobs where people are paying you to do all sorts of things. You can be doing activities that are sinful. Well, that doesn't come from a, a belief in Jesus, from a faith in Jesus. In fact, Sinful things go against the work of God by their very nature. In fact, we have to go back to Genesis 1. If we really want to understand what does God mean about work and the things that we're supposed to be doing in this life, the best place to go is back to the beginning. Genesis 1 portrays God as the first worker. He shows us how to work and what to work for. Six days of orderly creation, and at the end of it, he makes Adam and Eve in his own image, to do things like he does them. And verse 28, Genesis 1, 28, 
says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply over the, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And a key word there is subdue. And this is one of the cases where I think doing kind of a word study into the original can be really helpful. You see, when, when I hear the word subdue, most of the time it has negative connotations. Because we think of people subduing other people by using violence or manipulation or, or, or wealth or in some way. You know, one army subdues its enemies by, by defeating them, by maybe by enslaving them, things like that. But God does not command people to subdue each other here, but to subdue the earth. And the whole context is Adam and Eve, they've just been created, and God is giving them the world, and he's, he's about to set them in the Garden of Eden to care for it, to cultivate it. Because it's a garden. It's not a wilderness. God wants people to be gardeners of the world. And that's what subduing means in this, in this context. It turns out that nature actually can benefit when humans carefully and rightfully subdue it. Uh, forestry departments patrol wilderness areas to keep out invasive species, to control or prevent fires, to protect endangered animals, and, and all sorts of other things that help the land and maintain the balance that God had designed it for. And skilled ranchers can get trees to produce more and better fruits than they would naturally. In fact, people have been developing new hybrid fruits for thousands of years. The common lemon, which we can go down to the store to buy, is itself a hybrid fruit. It's, uh, it's thought to have originally been grown in ancient China when it was crossed with a uh, sour orange was crossed with a citron. Um, one scholar said of Genesis that subduing is asserting my will over something so that it yields its potential or increases its potential. That's what subduing is supposed to be. So when we subdue plants and animals in the way God intended, we can increase their numbers and their quality in a way that benefits everyone. Look at all the different breeds of horses that people have engineered, all the different dog breeds. And of course, it's been done uh, badly sometimes. And we'll see, uh, you can see many dog breeds that are extremely unhealthy because they were bred for selfish reasons by humans, not for reasons that would benefit the dog in any way. But it can be done well. When good farmers and ranchers subdue the land, the land produces more food that can then feed more people and more animals. So we have here another principle of godly work. It causes something to yield its potential or increase its potential. And there's another principle that might be obvious from what we've already said, which is God's work is designed to benefit others. That's why God made the world. He didn't need the world for himself. He wasn't so lonely that he th or so bored that he thought, well, let me make some toys to play with or let me make the, the best TV show ever that happens live in front of me. He was complete. He is complete and satisfied with himself entirely. He made the world for us, for humanity. When God looked over his finished creation and called it very good, he was saying it's very good for us. It's just the right sort of place for a people to be born, to grow up, and work, and play, and build, and sing, and paint, and swim, and explore, to study, and worship, and, and all the aspects of human culture in which we reveal the image of God. And so this means that we can also, that when we wonder what kind of work is God's work, we can also ask ourselves the question, well, does this benefit others in the way that God would desire? Not all human activity meets these requirements. So uh, from what I've just said, I've pulled out three questions you can ask yourselves, and I think they're already in the handout. You could ask yourself, well, what does this activity say about my belief in Jesus and my love for him? What potential is being released or increased by this activity? Does this activity help me do good for others? Because when I'm talking about work, I'm not just talking about the job that you go to and come back from at the end of the night, at the end of the day. Um, it's everything that we're involved with, our hobbies as well, uh, our relationships, our work, our, our artistic things that we want to make. Um, every, anything that we are working on, that we are striving to do, that we're learning about. Um, and you know, it's clear that certain activities 
produce bad answers to some or all of these questions. Um, it's been said that most people tend to try to get jobs either for money or for personal satisfaction. And the thing is, both of those reasons are fine in their proper place. They shouldn't be the primary reasons. But, you know, it make, makes sense, and the Bible says, workers deserve to be paid a fair wage. And, and it's just really good sense that you should avoid, if at all possible, a line of work that you just really hate or are not equipped for. That's not recommended. Each of us is equipped for different things. And uh, if you remember 1 Corinthians 12, that's the passage where Paul, the apostle, talks about the different parts of a body having equal worth. And he, he uses the metaphor to describe the church. He says, look, we, in the church, there are people with different jobs, different skills, uh, but they still have equal worth. And I'm not going to read the whole passage. It's all very relevant, but I just wanted to look at verses 27 to 31 in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 31. He says, now the, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and, and various kinds of tongues. And then he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? rhetorical questions. The answer is no. And he says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And then comes after that, chapter 13, which is the famous passage about love that Paul talks about, where he, he says, nothing we do is really worth anything if it's done without love. Love of God, the love of our neighbor, the two greatest commandments, Faith, hope, and love, these must season everything that we do. And that's what makes the work we do valuable, important. That's what makes it God's work. It's not a, a preacher or a pastor is doing better work than a carpenter or a computer programmer or someone who serves coffee at Starbucks. All of those can be done well for God. And of course, lots of Lots of even church work has been done badly. And if I haven't made it clear enough yet, doing the work of God is, is far more varied than just working for a church or a missionary organization. I mean, those are good things, but not everyone is really called or equipped for them. And if everyone was preaching or evangelizing, we wouldn't have any food to eat, or houses being built, or doctors studying medicine, or astronomers examining the stars, or our art would be too limited because, frankly, we need a huge variety of books and music and films and paintings and sculptures and so on and so forth. We need people who become masters in those areas. And, you know, I'm not just talking to adults with paying jobs here. I'm talking to kids, too. Twelve-year-olds 12 year olds like Jesus was and even younger, you can do the work of God at school, on the playground, in your room. There are a whole bunch of different ways. Pay attention to your teachers. Respect the people around you. Take important things seriously. Um, asking for help when you need it. Being good to your friends. All sorts of ways. Whether you earn an A or an F in school doesn't matter to God. It is your attitude and the state of your heart that matters. Anyone can do that by the grace of God. It is good work simply to be learning. Ephesians 2 uh, verse 10, it's one that should be familiar to all of us, especially those who have been in Awana. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepares work for us to do, for each one of us. What that means is that nobody is useless. Now, I know sometimes we look at people who are more talented than us, they're just so much cooler, they're more successful, they're doing more things than us, and it can make us feel pathetic. And you might think, what's the point of working so hard if I can't even do it like she does? Or who will ever care what I do? I'm a nobody, I'm not smart enough, I'm not skilled, I'm not unique. I know a lot of you have thought that before, and maybe you thought it this morning. But God knows you better than you know yourself, and he prepared work for you to do 
in your life before you were ever born. All you have to do is look around and you'll find plenty of work to do. And the way forward, it may not always seem obvious. You might need some help finding it. And the work won't always be easy. It won't always pay much. And it may not even be emotionally fulfilling. It could be really stressful. But there's always a way to serve God in your situation. You're doing the work of his kingdom. Now, I, I found this all to be very encouraging as I was reading about it and listening to sermons and just thinking it over. Because I, I worry about a lot of the things that I had hoped I would have accomplished by this point in my life. So it's good to know that God always does have a purpose for me. But while it can be encouraging to remember that, I have to be honest, sometimes even that fact isn't enough to encourage me because I feel like there's got to be more. Um, a question has occurred to me a lot over the past years. Maybe you've thought of it too. Uh, probably more likely the older you are. I'm hoping kids don't really have this thought. I hope it sounds like a foreign idea to them. But the, the question that, that arises naturally from, from two conditions. Um, one is the horrible presence of evil and suffering in the world. And the other is the promise of eternal happiness for all who are in Christ Jesus. And when you find yourself not liking your life very much or not liking the world very much, and if you don't have much hope that they're going to get better anytime soon, you might start to wonder, why do we have to live the rest of this life anyway? Why couldn't Christians just die and go to paradise as quickly as we can? Shouldn't that be what we desire? Now, we should know something feels wrong about that, but that's not the, the, the right answer. But it is a natural question to ask at some point. And uh, as I was trying to figure out a way to summarize the answer to this succinctly, I thought of the movie Gladiator from the 2000. And uh, at the very beginning of this movie, there's a, a Roman general. He's given a speech to his soldiers just before they're about to join battle with the enemy. And these, these men are, are so scared. We see they're, some of them are trembling in their armor. Some of them, uh, some of them pee themselves because they're so frightened they, about the, the possibility of death from this terrifying enemy. And so the general, when he wants to encourage them so they're strong enough to fight, he tells them something that doesn't take away the fear that they feel, but he gives them a context for it. And he says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. It doesn't make the battle any less terrifying. It doesn't save a lot of their lives. Many of them will still die and get horribly injured. But it reminds them their lives and their actions here are worth something. And they will not go unjudged. Now, there's nothing particularly God-honoring about the battle they go into in the movie. The characters are, are pagans fighting a war of conquest for the Roman Empire. But the principle is one that is found in the Bible. Our work here matters for eternity. So back in John 6, verse 27, we had read, you know, Jesus told the people to work for food that endures to eternal life. And we find him continuing that idea in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you want, you could turn to Matthew chapter 6, Verses 19 to 21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there, will, there your heart will be also. What does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven? How do we work like that? How do we go to school with that in mind? Well, go back to Genesis 1 again and what we talked about, the original work that God gave humanity, to fill the earth and subdue it, to fill the earth with, with humanity, with, with people, with human cultures, with human civilization, and to subdue the earth by caring for it, by cultivating it, by making the earth more lovely and productive than before, not just using it up for our own desires or our own greed, you know, but when sin entered the world, it corrupted everything in the world, not just humanity. So our work doesn't go the way it should. The earth, you try to farm it, it produces weeds, the crops may fail, uh, the weather is unpredictable or it doesn't come the way you want to, be, want to. This extends to every aspect of human work. We, we can never seem to do every, anything exactly or as good as we want to. I mean, our industry 
leads to great advances in science and technology and manufacturing. And there are some people in the world who think that simple technological advancement's enough to make people better. That that's the sign that we're getting better over time. But the reality is all you gotta do is look around the news or look at history. All more technology does is give us more tools to express our, our nature, which is corrupted by sin. And as a result, the, uh, the industries which can lead to great things like more food for people, better houses or medicines and, and wonderful scientific discoveries, those also lead to greater pollution or violence and lust and pride and every manner of sin. And as a result, neither human civilization nor the natural world is as productive or beautiful as it should be. If God were to remove his common grace from us, we would quickly destroy ourselves and the earth. It's only by God's grace that, that hasn't happened yet. And yet, what does God tell us about heaven? What will the kingdom of God be like? There's a, few, there's a lot of clues throughout the Bible about this. I'm only going to look at two little, little clues in the book of Revelation as I end, getting close to the end. Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 to 10, gives us a vision of when Jesus comes fully into his kingdom and heaven is established throughout the earth. And in this vision, there's 24 elders, it says, and they seem, they seem to represent God's people, us. And in verse 10 of Revelation, it, it describes them casting their crowns before the throne of Jesus. And it seems likely, as I was trying to do some of the study and reading about this, it seems likely that the crowns represent the, all the, the produce of these people's lives the good works they've done in life. And, you know, God or Jesus spoke very often that there would be rewards for us in heaven for things that we do in life, uh, the treasures in heaven, as we just read, and there's other points of the Gospels where he talks about them. And these become our crowns, these rewards. They're signs of God's goodness to us because we know that God will glorify all believers when we come into his presence. But what do we see in the vision? We see these elders casting their crowns at the foot of Jesus at his throne. They're acknowledging that these good things, that the very glory that they have now received by coming into the kingdom, it really belongs to Jesus. He is the worthy one. He is the one who gave them good things in the first place, who enabled them to do works. He is alone is worthy of true honor. And what this means is that everything we do now for Jesus is part of his glory both now and then. And it's part of the glory we will receive then. And more than that, we have reason to hope that our work will actually be completed in heaven. And here I have to remind you, heaven is not some far-off place. It's not some spiritual dimension with golden clouds and golden towers where we all just play harps forever and everything's kind of ethereal and, and we're happy ghosts or we turn into angels or whatever you might have thought of it. Pop culture gets so much wrong, and, and a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of Christian teaching has sometimes been very lazy in this area. The final heaven where we live our eternal lives with God is here on earth. It's earth remade, renewed. In Revelation 21, 5, there's another vision where Jesus declares, Behold, I am making all things new. Not, I will make all all new things, but I will make all things that are already existed, that have already been created, I will make them new. When we see, what we see in heaven is going to be recognizable to us as things which existed or should have existed here on earth, but we will see them without corruption, without damage, and, and in the most complete state, that better than we can ever imagine. The kingdom of heaven will be what the Garden of Eden was supposed to become, if Adam and Eve had continued to work it as God intended, a place without sin, a place where God and man lived together and walked together by, side by side, worked together in the garden, enjoying each other's presence. That's the end result of our work here in this life. And one of the, the most encouraging things about this is it doesn't rely on us, on our skill. We don't have to complete the work. We, we can't. Nothing we do in this life can be truly complete and perfect yet. The fact is, whatever you go out and do, whether you're studying at school, 
or whether you're working in an office or programming software or serving coffee at Starbucks or writing a book or working on a difficult friendship or, just, or dancing just for the fun of it, it's all going to be flawed in some way. You're never going to quite be able to pull out that part of in, in, that's inside you that you're trying to express. Because one of the reasons we do anything is to express ourselves. God made each one of us as a distinct person, a soul filled with thoughts and dreams and hopes and joys. We're all a bit different from each other, but there are common themes that run through us. Of course, our main, the main common theme is our need for a relationship with God. You know, we, we hang the crayon scribbles of our children on our refrigerators, not because we think they're as compelling as the paintings of the Renaissance master, but because the child conveyed something about themselves just at the simple act of, of drawing and handing it to their parent. You know, when we're adults, we, we tend to become a lot more judgmental, a lot more exacting, um, especially with ourselves. If you've ever tried to create something, then you know the frustration of trying and failing to communicate your vision. Even if other people say you've been successful and they're amazed, if you're lucky enough or fortunate enough for that to happen, you know, every artist will, can look at their greatest masterpieces and go, eh, it's still not right. I still see my mistakes. I still see where I, I didn't get through what I wanted to. Um, there's always something that I'm glimpsing or feeling in my mind's eye, and I just can't get it right no matter how much I try. And of course, even when you are working on something hard, you get interrupted by life. Uh, and it can be hard to find the right time to do all the things you want to. But I have a hope that the work I attempt in this life will be completed in the life to come. There's a song that we used to sing at Lopitas Bible Fellowship that went, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in you. And it's based on Philippians 1, verse 6, where Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And so the song uh, continues. The song is by a man named Steve Green. And he continues the thought with this verse. He says, if the struggle you're facing is slowly replacing your hope with despair, or the process is long and you're losing your song in the night, you can be sure that the Lord has his hand on you. Safe and secure, he will never abandon you. You are his treasure, and he finds his pleasure in you. And the final example that I'm going to give you is of this sermon. There's a lot more that I wanted to say. There's more in my notes. There's more scripture references that I had. Uh, and I've been feeling this message for many weeks. I've been kind of slowly circling around it, picking up ideas in here and there. I never seemed able to really nail it down. And a lot of that is is my fault. I didn't work on it as hard as I should have. I, didn't, I got distracted a lot. I didn't pray over it enough. And this morning, I was up too late trying to make sense of it, and it, it, frankly, I've talked way longer than I expected to. And I still haven't said everything that I feel I need to say. I haven't even gotten to the further part of the application where we should consider what this hope of completed work means for how we work here and now. Maybe I'll get to that another time. But the point is, when you realize that all your work here has a purpose, that all your sufferings are worthwhile, that even your failures, and even the things you never get around to completing, will be redeemed and completed by Jesus Christ when he comes again. If you can get a taste of that, that's a, that little taste is like a drop of the sweetest honey. Sweeter than that, just about anything else in this world. And I'm hoping that we can taste that drop of heaven again and again and know that the Lord is good. So look at the 12-year-old the Jesus. Now he's eager and happy to be in the temple, the church where God is being studied and worshipped. And he calls it his father's house, a place of warmth, of love, of belonging and safety where he finds his true purpose. Now we know that the house of God is us, the people of God who gather to worship him. So my hope and prayer is that we'll work to make the church, both in Milpitas and around the globe, a place where we encounter God's warmth and love and where we find our true belonging and our true safety in the arms of Christ. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you for the work that you do in our hearts and our lives. We ask that you would be our guide and our fellow worker to help us through all of our, all the steps of our life that you appoint for us. And that no matter what you give us in this life, that we will be able to say, I will take the adventure that God gives me in humility and in faithfulness. And when we fall, pick us up again. Help us to know that we are being carried by you all the time. And enable us also to encourage and support each other. In Jesus' name, amen.